Hello everybody, last week I put out a video in which I discussed the most recent costs associated with my 2013 Ferrari F12 Berlinetta. If you haven't seen that video, in short, I was driving the car in summer of last year and it developed a bit of a fault which handily turned out to be just a wheel speed sensor but once I'd done a few other things as the car was already in the garage I was given a bill totaling some £9,000. Because I don't want to tell you everything from that video in this one, if you haven't seen it, I recommend that you go and watch it, and I'll put a link up here somewhere. And in today's video, what I would like to do is answer some of the more popular comments from that video, because many of you had the same thing to say, and also discuss just a little bit my personal philosophy regarding Ferrari ownership. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Just this morning, in fact, I received another comment on that video from somebody saying, how on earth do you afford all of this stuff? Well, the simple answer is, I make a lot of videos on YouTube, have been doing so for quite some time, and I'm also lucky to have a number of sponsors for the channel, including today's, which is Poker. And it just so happens I think they are the perfect sponsor for this video because, let's face it, when you're talking about supercars or exotics like my F12, many people would say they're just not worth the hassle. And the best thing about them is getting to just look at them. And so, if you think that's the best way to experience supercar ownership, may I introduce you to this. My 1 8th scale Lamborghini Aventador LP700-4, the original, and in my eyes, the best looking, presented here in what I also happen to think is the best colour, Giallo Orion. I think these are a stunning piece of kit, and though I have driven one and wasn't really in love with it, they do keep haunting my dreams, and if you'd like to own one without the continual and ruinous maintenance costs, Poker do this lovely 1 8th scale model, and with my discount code JM10, you can get it for 10% off, and with this display case, normally £340 for free. If you fancy something to build like this for yourself, it took me about three days over the new year, and I've got to say, I did find quite enjoyable actually, despite having essentially no experience of it. Make sure to check out to their website, and don't forget to use my link. More details will be in the description down below. Now, back to the real deal. Okay, that's out of the way, let's get down to it, shall we? There's a few different things I'd like to address in today's video, and if I've left anything out that you want to discuss, I'll invite you all to head into the comments section after. The first thing that people had to say was that clearly what I'd experienced was proof that Ferraris were simply poorly built. And I just don't think that is true or fair. Now, I'm not gonna say that these are made like a Lexus. I'm gonna get onto that one a little bit fairly soon. However, I think when you consider in what small quantities the cars are built, they're actually pretty decent. At no point in time has any Ferrari ever left me stranded or failed to proceed. Yes, when this one threw its wobbler, it didn't want to do more than 30 mile an hour, but it would at least do that. And then after you turned it off and on again a couple of times, it then carried on as normal. That issue turned out to be a wheel speed sensor, and that's a problem I've had with a whole bunch of other cars. In fact, most recently, my MG ZTT, which I revealed only a couple of days ago, and a thank you if you watched that video, that needed a wheel speed sensor. My BMW a few years back needed a wheel speed sensor. My Peugeot needed a wheel speed sensor. And I'd wager all of them are made by Bosch. This is a really fairly common failure point on all cars, and yes, it cost me a little bit more than it might have done on a BMW to fix it here, but the parts and labour between them were about 300 quid, and the diagnostics time I think totaled to about 150 pounds. So had I wanted to, I could have walked away from my last visit with a bill of less than 500 quid. 
How did it turn into nine grand? Well, because I did a bunch of other stuff as well. See previous video if you haven't already. Now, one of the things that I really wanted to get round to was sorting this car's paintwork issues. And again, people took Ferrari to task. First off, for the unusual way that they paint the front bumper with the body color on the bottom and then black on the top. Honestly, having looked at it quite a bit, I'm not really sure what other ways they could have done it unless they wanted to make everything out of separate pieces and that then only adds complexity, more failure points and it just wouldn't look all that good. Sure, I had my Ferrari main dealer's paint guy do it and that's why the bill was likely higher than it might have been had I taken it somewhere else. But when you look at that front end and you see how intricate all of that stuff is, I just didn't want to take the risk of getting it done by somebody that might make a mistake. Had that happened with Ferrari, they'd have had to have rectified it at their own cost. And for me, essentially what I was paying for was the insurance to make sure the job was done right. the paintwork on this car cost about three and a half thousand pounds easily the biggest of all the items that I wanted to tend to and that was something that was pre-existing certainly the front end was already an issue and I think probably the door as well when I got the car this wasn't something that's happened during my ownership experience I knew about them when I got it and I paid an appropriate price knowing at some point it would have to be sorted and I'm sure there would be plenty of people out there who would be happy to drive a car around with issues like that but for me on a car like this it just didn't look good did it every time I saw it on the driveway I just went oh that's getting worse I need to sort it and I am delighted that I have because honestly it makes this car look like it's worth another 50 grand sadly that's not the case at all but you know in my head that's how it works One person in the comment section even used the presence of stone chips as proof of Ferrari's substandard build quality, and that just baffled me. I mean, they're stone chips on a high-performance car with a reasonably large frontal area, and you're going to see them pretty obviously when they happen because of the way the car's been painted. To me, stone chips is proof of nothing more than stones. I suppose you could get the car PPF'd, but looking at that, I'm really not sure how you would. And honestly, the cost of getting the thing PPF'd is the same as getting it resprayed. So if come sale time, and as of this video being filmed, I haven't sold it, I've thought about it, but then I've driven it again and gone, oh, it's really good though. Anyway, the cost of PPFing that front end would basically be the same as respraying it should the next owner want it. So, not really that fussed about it and having known a few people that have had their cars PPF'd only for a stone to go through it anyway and then wind up with a repair build that's double because of that I'm just honestly I'm not really that convinced by PPF I, I, I'm just not next up the corrosion yeah sure the car had a little bit of it on each side about that much at the base of the driver and passenger's door but corrosion is something that happens on basically all cars I'm sure even a Lexus at some point will suffer from corrosion and um, if there's somebody out there that has a Lexus and has corroded please pop into the comment section and make me feel better about myself but the fact is that corrosion certainly in this instance is something I think that is more time than mileage related yes the car has only done just under 33,000 miles but it's also now 11 years old and had you said to somebody oh my car's got a bit of corrosion it's 10 years old and done 100,000 miles you wouldn't really batter an eyelid but yeah it's annoying it did get sorted yes I had to pay for it Ferrari do have an anti-corrosion warranty but it's nowhere near long enough even on their brand new cars I will criticize the company when I think they deserve it trust me however everybody I know and I mean everybody that's had a McLaren has had to have some paintwork issues rectified and those are things that have happened within the first few months of ownership in some cases Lamborghinis I know can get it Aston Martins certainly get it I've seen plenty of Porsches with corrosion my BMW had corrosion and that was only about six years old it's just a thing it happens it's a car it's made of metal it can happen get over it
Now, in the interest of being fair and balanced, yes, there are plenty of things about this car that do frustrate me, and in many cases are just weird, daft Italian quirks, often related to electrics. So, for example, if you're driving along, you're listening to the radio, and you realise that you need to defrost the rear window, when you press that button, you'll lose all of your radio reception. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something's going on there, and the two do not like each other. It's uh, rather humorous. It took me a while to work out what on earth was going on, and then when I did, I just thought, ah, those Italians. You also, and this is possibly my biggest gripe with the car, weird, I know, when you're going through the list of radio stations with a little scroll wheel down here, no matter which one you choose, if you aren't in the presets menu, it'll just go to preset number six. So in my case, oh, you want BBC Radio 2? Ah, you mean Planet Rock. Do you want Heart 80s? Ah, you mean Planet Rock. Do you want Premier Christian? Ah, you must mean Planet Rock. Could upset a few people, that one. Anyway, it's just a daft, weird, annoying thing. You have to scroll through them manually one by one using the, the little levers on the back of the wheel, which incidentally are exactly the same as you'd find on the back of the wheel of many a uh, Jeep and Alpha and other products from the FCA era. I had to get a new starter motor cable installed because this one wasn't quite up to the task and so after you'd given the car a run it was nice and warm, you filled it up with fuel and you went to start it 30 seconds later, it'd be a little slow to fire. Now for many people that would be simply an annoyance and something they'd be willing to live with. I had exactly the same problem caused by exactly the same thing on my Porsche. Yet. When I told people about it on the Porsche, nobody said, oh God, proof of that terrible German build quality. With the Ferrari though, everybody's really keen to lay in to the Italians and tell everybody how they know the car is so awfully built. The fact is though, I would wager that whatever brand it is that you're into, be it Ferrari, Ford, Fiat, Vauxhall, Saab, Volvo, doesn't really matter. You'll probably really like your car, and you'll know they're not actually perfect. They've got issues, even stuff like Toyota, Lexus, Honda, legendarily well-built cars. They do have issues. But you like the car enough that you're willing to deal with it, and you'll also, I'm sure, be aware that sometimes these issues are due to owner neglect. And so really, not necessarily the car's fault. So you just carry on and love your car, but there will be people out there who say, oh God, these things are terrible, these things are awful. I know at least one person that swears blind Toyota's build quality is absolutely the worst, it's garbage, and he's got absolutely no idea why people obsess over Japanese machinery. And I get it, I understand, everybody's experience is different, it comes from a different place. For him, that's come from his own experience of those particular products. For me, it's come from my experience of these particular products. Oh, this is not Ferrari territory. That's properly frozen there. <laughs> As you can see, I do use these things all year round because I do believe it's good for them. Cars do not like sitting. Older Ferraris in particular, they hate it if they're left to sit around. And this, I think, is the source of much of Ferrari's poor reputation. People are afraid to put miles on the cars because the dealers have all convinced you that they will fall apart once they hit 30,000. And that, to me, is just daft, nonsensical, and it's the, the biggest case I know of someone shooting themselves in the foot. If you took a 911 GT3 to a Porsche dealer with 30,000 miles on, okay, these days they're not gonna like it so much, but someone's definitely gonna buy that car. There's absolutely no reason that this car can't easily do 100,000 miles without anything really major going wrong, and probably quite a bit more than that. I am sorely, sorely tempted to try and find out. And if you think I should do 100,000 miles in this car, do me a favor, in fact, do me too. Put that in the comment section down below and share this video with a friend of yours. It gets a million views. I'm gonna keep this thing and I'm gonna try and do it. The actual service on this car, including the new auxiliary belt and the redesigned tensioner or pulley that I had to have put on, cost about £2,000. And I think for a car of this type, of this performance, that's not really all that bad. A lot of people in the comment section wanted to talk about money. And as a Brit, I sort of try and skirt around that. I'm very happy to talk about what something has cost me, but I'm generally very, very wary of talking about my own 
personal circumstances and this is because in Britain we have this really weird sort of inverse snobbery thing going on where basically people sneer at anything nice or anybody that's been successful in life. You'll see it in threads all over the world, on Facebook, on Piston Heads, on Instagram, everywhere you go. People don't like it in Britain when someone else has something nice. This is not universal and I've actually had generally a pretty good time with this car. Nobody really has made a negative comment about it, but I do know that it does happen. And it's really rather unfortunate because I'm in the position where I'm lucky enough to be able to have this car. I really enjoy it and I want to be out being seen enjoying it because I like people to see these cars. That's how you inspire the next generation of petrol heads. I remember really vividly the day on the way home from school I saw a Noble M12, the most special thing. That was amazing. We talked about that for days. I remember coming home one night and seeing a Lamborghini Diablo at my local petrol station. That was just... That was amazing. Had Thor himself got out of it, I wouldn't have been any more impressed. But we're Britons, we're a bit weird. And one thing I did see a few people commenting was, oh well, if you can't afford it, you shouldn't have it. I can afford it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I've got it on finance, I'm very transparent about that. If you want to know, I put £25,000 down as a deposit and it costs me about £1,300 a month. With Charles and Dean, should you want your own crikey, that was a bit close. Most of these cars today are financed and then there are still a bunch of people out there that consider something on finance not really to be yours. And if you want to call this the Banks Ferrari, be my guest. I'm really not offended by it. The fact was, I didn't have the cash at the time to buy it outright. I didn't know if I wanted to keep it all that long anyway, and it just seemed like a good way to get into the car at what was a good price. There was an opportunity, and I decided to take it. I didn't know at the time whether I really liked the F12 all that much, and it was a car that took a long time to reveal itself to me, but... I've got to say, this is absolutely spectacular, really quite something. But even those who are multi-millionaires and that could afford or do buy these things cash, just because they've got the money to spend on something doesn't mean they're always happy about it. I've known people that own McLaren F1s and they moan about how much the insurance cost is. Yes, of course, they can afford it, but if you had a billion quid, you still wouldn't be impressed if you got told, oh, it's 25 grand a year to insure your car. It's gonna wind up at 10 pound a mile just for the insurance. You would be annoyed, wouldn't you? You'd rather spend the money on something else. I even this morning had one really weird comment from somebody on my MG ZTT video, where they were saying that because I've got these Ferraris, me doing stuff with an MG is some sort of faux humble brag type thing. And that I just, I just don't get that. I like my MGs. I bought them years ago. Well, I have one anyway. At the time I said how much I liked it, but the fact was back then, I liked MGs and I liked Ferraris. I just couldn't afford the Ferrari. Now, I can afford the Ferrari and I can afford the MG. Having the one shouldn't really prevent me from being able to enjoy the other. What it can do though is give me a little bit of perspective and one thing I will say for the F12 in particular and in fact all the Ferraris is that if you look at the money spent on them as a percentage cost of the purchase price actually they're some of the cheapest cars in the fleet. Yes I know that's a sort of wonky way to look at things but if you want to see a car that's had money spent on it that in some ways really isn't worth it go and watch the videos I've done on my Toyota Celica. I've spent double the purchase price on that car just trying to get it up to a reasonable standard. My Honda S2000, that failed. I've just had an engine bought for it that cost me twice as much as the car. I paid eight and a bit thousand pounds for that. I'm now into it for 30 odd grand. At least with this, if I did sell it, I'm gonna recoup a much larger percentage of what I've put into it. That's just the way it is. That Honda, I'll never get even close to what I've put into it back if I did sell it, and that's why I'm not selling it. I know a few people are asking about where the Honda is, and yes, there will be a video update soon. Curiously, and I don't really know exactly why this was, but a lot of people, by which I mean 
dozens of you commented on that video saying I should just get a Lexus LC500 instead. And I don't know exactly what it was about this particular video that made so many of you think, mm, yes, he should really replace that car with an LC500. Maybe it's the fact that to some, this is a paragon of unreliability and the LC500 is the picture of durability whilst being on the face of it much the same thing as this. Now, I love the LC500. It's a fantastic car. And there is a conceivable scenario that in a year or two, I might have to get rid of some of the stuff I've got on finance, namely this and the 430. Those are the only two cars that are financed. Everything else I own outright, including the 550. And there will be another video on that soon. And again, that's been away for a year, but because of daft stuff that is not the car's fault. And if such a scenario does come to pass, I have to sell up and I want to try and replace these cars with something that does more or less the same job, but that I can afford to own outright, an LC500 would definitely be top of the list. There is a reason I have done several videos saying why I think it's such a fantastic car. I really, really love them dearly. And in the wake of your many comments, I popped onto Auto Trader and saw actually they've become relatively affordable with examples of the top of the line Sport Plus V8 now being available from under 50,000 quid. And that's a lot of car for the money. Comes also with that Lexus 10 year warranty, which is really quite nice. But, and here's the thing, the LC500, nice as it may be, is just no F12. This, even at 30, 40 mile an hour in minus one degrees, is just sensational. The whole thing from the outside to the inside to the engine, it's just a delight. And yes, it is a bit of a diva. Yes, there are things about it that annoy, but it also speaks to you in a way that very, very few cars do. It's properly special, this. I love it so very much. And I've always been the sort of person that said, I really, really hate to get to the end of this life and say, you know, I had the chance to buy a Ferrari, but instead I bought a Lexus because that seemed like the sensible thing to do. Okay, the RC500 is maybe the least sensible of all Lexus, but still, you get the idea. Oh, this looks a bit chilly as well. Let's take, take it easy through here. And I'm absolutely not ruling an LC500 out. In fact, I'm pretty sure you'd watch videos if I got one. Again, if you think I should just chop this in for that, tell me, because I could sell this and basically with the DB9 gone, I could get an LC500. My finances are not unlimited, that I can assure you. Sometimes you get people that think, clearly, I've got 20p to my name, and other times you get people that think I'm a multi-millionaire and I can afford anything I want. The, the, neither of those things is true. I spend most of my money on cars because I really, really love them and I'm lucky enough that it's my business. I can kind of justify it, sort of. And this really leads me onto the final thing that I want to say, which is my real philosophy when it comes to these things. Like I said at the beginning, I could have taken this car to Meridian and walked away with a 500 pound bill, not the 9,000 pound one that I did. Meridian didn't tell me I had to do anything. They said that the service was due in time terms, but they knew it wasn't due in mileage. They weren't forcing anything, but, I have now experienced so many cars where previous owners have had work that they really should have done, but they've decided to skimp on it and left me in the lurch, left me paying bills for things that I didn't do, that I didn't cause, that didn't happen during my stewardship. At some point in the near future, I'm gonna do a video update on my other half's 986 Boxster. And that, I assure you, was an eye-watering experience. Never have I known such a cheap car to cost quite as much money. It puts even my MGs to shame. That's a, been a frustrating experience, I have to tell you. At least getting the Ferraris worked on has been a joy. The Celica is an absolute nightmare. Trying to find somewhere that actually does the job that they say has been just awful. So if you do happen to know a good Celica specialist out there, tell me. And don't tell me Fensport because they don't work on them anymore. Yeah, very annoying. I offered them money and they don't want to take it. 
and the fact is, yes, this car has cost me quite a bit of money, but as I've said many, many times before, it is a Ferrari. I have always wanted one since I was yay high and understood what a Ferrari was. However, at no point in time was I ever under the illusion it would be anything other than fairly expensive. And I am now in the extraordinarily fortunate position, chiefly thanks to the likes of your good self for watching all these videos and subscribing, which if you haven't done already, please do that now. And I can do this. I can enjoy the cars and run them, and I want to do right by the car, because I think that is the right thing to do. So if I've got the option to make something better, I'll always take it. And so that, I hope, explains a little bit of my personal philosophy when it comes to owning a car like this. I want to say a big thank you once again to all of you for watching all of the videos. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.